Let's make this bigger. All right, who's heard of uh, macros, Scala macros? It's an experimental feature that's been introduced in 2.10, I think. And it's going through constant changes. But uh, so macros, uh, anyone here has uh, written any C or C++? Of course, everyone has. So there's def, if def. Those are like the primitive form of macros. You, it's basically a glorified string search and replace. And of course, uh, some of you might have heard of Clojure or used Clojure, another programming, uh, popular programming language on JVM, and also functional. And macro, of course, is a key component in Clojure programming. And Clojure programs are Clojure data strip, uh, uh, structures. So you manipulate lists, expand them. So basically taking some form of code, generating some other form of code. The world's most popular macro engine is probably PHP, taking some form of uh, uh, spaghetti code and puking out uh, HTML. <laughs> so uh, everyone has some expo uh, exposure to macros at some point. So I'm talking about a very uh, good use case that has helped us a lot. So this is the slides I used for the uh, Northeast Scala Symposium talk back in February, like right before the snowmageddon. So I guess most people there were suffering from brain freeze and not remembering much. So it's OK. I'm going to just repeat myself here. So yeah, uh, I work with the rec music recommendation team at Spotify. I've been there for almost four years. I actually only started using Scala since 2013. And I started with scouting and uh, expanded to Spark, also working on Storm. See uh, the pattern there, like, uh, exclusively framework that starts with S. Worked on Symfony back in the days. Anyway, so we use scouting a lot. And uh, there's a very popular data combo, processing combo. So Parquet, uh, open source library, uh, columnar storage format for HDFS from uh, Twitter, cl collaboration between Twitter and Cloudera. So basically, uh, instead of saving, uh, storing your data as like a row major, like row after row, and to read data, like in, say in case where data is not, your rows are not of uh, equal size, then you can just jump to certain offsets and uh, randomly seek a particular record. You have to read or scan through all the bytes to, to, to just read a subset of the data which is pretty inefficient. Parquet idea came from the database world, the relation database world, basically storing uh, columns, uh, values in a single column together in what, uh, what they call the row groups. So say 50 values of column one, then 50 values of column two. The nice thing about that is you can skip column groups pretty efficiently. You can estimate how far ahead in the file you want to seek. And that's a huge performance boost, especially on Hadoop, where you're scanning through terabytes of data. But uh, a common case like our key log format, which uh, a lot that logs user play playback music, which has maybe 50 or 80 columns. And most cases, we read three or four columns. And that, in most cases, is a 10 times uh, speed up. So Parquet is a very nice tool for doing those kind of big data processing. There's also Avro, which is a schema uh, or data serialization format. So you have a schema file that compiles to Java or some other programming language uh, static uh, class code with uh, getters and getters and setters. You also have uh, type safety from uh, you have data types like strings, integers, longs, boolean, also nullable fields, and also uh, arrays and maps in Avro. It's uh, very popular. It's uh, built into a lot of the data processing engines like Hive, Scouting, Spark, uh, Impala, those as, and Spark, of course. So we use these together. Parquet library supports reading and writing data as every rep representation inside your uh, Java or Scala code. And then there's the processing um, framework, which can be Scouting or Spark in our case. A Scala processing framework. So we use these three tools together. But there are some problems. Mm. Let's just look at the schema first. So this is a typical packet schema. You have a Java-ish, like 
and domain name in uh, rever uh, reversed domain name uh, namespace, and then you have fields and the types. This is what it looks like in a pipeline code. So you can say read from this account class that's compiled from the schema, and you have getters which are type safe get name and amount. So one of them is string, the other is probably integer. And you can do the reduce things like that. Pretty nice. Um, for Parquet, there are a number of features that helps with performance. So column projection, basically selecting the columns you want, and it will be able to seek in the file and only read bytes that you want and uh, skip the columns that you don't. And uh, that's a performance boost. The other one is called filter predicate. So because it stores uh, rows, uh, groups of uh, values together, and each row group has mini maximum and minimum index, kind of like uh, indexing in a relational database. So you can say, I want user who listen to a track for more than two minutes. And if, say, a 50K block of log files has no such thing, and the mi mi minimum is lower than that, a maximum is lower than that, then Parquet will be able to uh, skip the entire row group, which further speed up things. This is super helpful in ad hoc queries, like searching for a particular subset of users or a subset of data. So yeah, these two combined can often uh, offer like 10 times speed up. The problems. All right, so this is uh, native code as uh, we have seen before. In pipeline, you get this data arrow uh, class with getters that's type safe and also you get auto completion from the IDE. Whereas uh, Parquet use strings to identify columns and also it supports nested columns, so which is like, you know, user dot name or user dot email things like that. So you can have nested column, except it's in string, so you have to type it or you have to know the schema ahead of time. Yeah, that's error prone, and also it's unsafe. The compiler is unable to check for typos. There's no autocomplete, so you end up typing and injure your fingers. <laughs> also. Uh, uh, Avro has this convention that changes field names into this camel case, so it can be confusing. Some users might accidentally use camel case uh, in the field schema and end up, you know, all sorts of typo and uh, confusion. So that's another problem, potential problem. So to do this uh, correctly, you need to have the schema on hand while write the code. That's pretty bad, and also it's hard to migrate existing code. So we can just run them as this. Predicate is even worse. So pipe.predicate, that's like a Scala collection type filter. You can have you know, simple Boolean logic and you can chain them. Uh, Parquet predicate has this, uh, uses this so-called visitor pattern. So you construct the tree yourself using this kind of prefix notation. So you have the function and with two arguments, first one is the Column name, of course, you need to know both the type and the name ahead of time. Column two is uh, the value. Again, you need to know the uh, type of the value. And in case of uh, Java primitives, because Scala again trying to fix Java and uh, failed, so you end up with this kind of type system full bar, and you have to do the cohesion to make it work. So that's pretty horrible. Uh, it's like closure, but worse. So yeah. This is where Marco you know, shines, because it solves this exact problem by eliminating all these human errors. So just go back, and uh, here we have a typical expression. You have some uh, anonymous uh, argument underscore, which represents some uh, Avro object, and then you have getters, which are just you know, selecting a field and calling a method. And then you have a predicate, some operator and value. Internal, this compiles to something like that. So x dollar one, some internal representation of the anonymous uh, variable or value. Dot get method names and then and parentheses for calling it. And then actually dot uh, greater than, it's also uh, a method or select in this case in the internal compiler lingo, so it looks like that. And also Scala takes care of the 
the boxing of uh, primitive types. So that's why, or unboxing, because get amount returns the Java LAN uh, integer, which is a boxed object, and Scala uh, comp uh, compiler converts it back to a primitive int. This is uh, what it looks like in the raw code. I mean, you don't have to look this, but as uh, someone who deals with macro, it's uh, good for, for debugging. So basically, selecting is the dot name part, and apply is calling some method or function. And then, of course, a constant 10 that's a literal. And then you have a list of arguments, and this is a single argument, 10. So everything boils down to something like this, apply, select, apply, select, so on and so forth, and then constants and lists of arguments. So it looks complex, but in fact, it's pretty uh, easy to understand once you get uh, the gist. Of course, uh, to deal with code like this, we can always use recursion and pattern matching, the two key features in Scala. So the macro code could kind of look like this. Um, in our projection case, we are saying, I want to project on an Avro type T with whatever selector like T get dot get value get amount. So the user supply a bunch of such getters which are expressing the form of lambda. In the macro case, they are passed to the compiler during compilation is the abstract syntax tree. That's hence you have the macro implementation and uh, you have uh, the C dot expression, which is the expression of the code that user just typed in the, uh, in the dot Scala file. And then you say user type underscore dot get, get name or get amount that's passed into the macro implementation that apply in there is C dot expression. And then you do pattern matching and recursion on the tree and uh, you generate new trees. Predicate is pretty sim uh, similar, except the input type is some uh, function, some lambda that takes the arrow type T and returns a Boolean. So you can do all sorts of uh, uh, Boolean predicate or chain them with uh, logical operators like and or, or not, etc. The return type in this case is a filter predicate, which is a, a class in the Parquet library. So this is what the code looks like just a lambda that returns a boolean. All right, so there are a bunch of things I have to deal so that to, in order to make uh, the code uh, looks nice and uh, intuitive. Of course, I mean, this, this user code is passed to the compiler as an AST, so I mean, unless you expect what the user is gonna input and deal with them, otherwise there's, you, you, you can't, you can, you can transform a tree that you don't expect. So there are some limitations. For example, uh, there are cases, well, the, the Parquet API, you have this uh, operator, and the first argument is the caller name, second argument is the value you want to compare to. But user might flip them, so a greater than 10 and 10 less than a, that's equivalent in normal Scala code, but not in Parquet API. So I have to recognize these cases and flip them. Of course, pr uh, primitive and boxed values, that's another Java problem. Box types can be null, while Scala types will not be null. The unified Scala int will not be null, but a Java integer can be null. So these are cases I have to deal with. Again, numerical type cohesion, like, you know, a dot get amount, where get amount returns integer, you can compare it with uh, long type, which usually works if you type, uh, write a standard Java or Scala code, the compiler will supply some implicit conversion, but not in this case. I have to deal with it uh, manually, but it works. Again, and the last thing is Boolean. So the Parquet API, you compare Boolean with, you know, you still have to do the equal, call a name, uh, Boolean value, but get Boolean is a valid uh, expression in, uh, in Scala or Java. It, uh, it, it evaluate, it evaluates to a Boolean type, so you have to deal with that and, and expand it to, you know, true or not. There are a few things that doesn't work, but that's just the limitation of, you know, using Parquet with Avro. There's a Parquet ticket 34, so right now it doesn't have any predicates on arrays, so you can't say, I want to filter our records with this 
array or repeated field with size of certain value, or just e inspect each individual items in the array. So that doesn't work. Also, you can't filter if a nested record, like the record, every uh, the entire record is now or not now. So that uh, echo operator only works on the on the leaf node level. So that's another limitation. And again, uh, Avro is not really designed to work with Parquet. It's kind of shoehorn in this case to maintain the backwards compatibility with legacy code base. So once you do Parquet projection, say I have 50 fields and I select two of them, the rest of the 48 fields, the method will still exist on the Parquet, uh, on the Avro object. There will still be get something that I don't want, but it will return now. And when you try, try to serialize such object, like writing it back to disk or do a shuffle or drawing, not serializable uh, exception. Well, Avro is a serialization format. It's uh, uh, funny, like, it, funny that it's like one of the most hard to serialize Java type, but yeah. Anyway, so this code is open source. We use it uh, at Spotify in most of our pipelines with Parquet. So you can look it up on GitHub, and uh, that's it. Questions? Yes? So would you recommend using Parquet or Avro? This is a good question. Yeah, the question is if uh, I would recommend Parquet with Avro. I would recommend Parquet, and depending on the framework of choice, if you use uh, Spark or Hive or maybe Presto, I think it's built-in uh, um, support, and also Impala has built-in Parquet support. In those frameworks, you don't have to use Avro because they, they treat Parquet fields as like part of a SQL query or you know data frame API, you treat them as, uh, treat the field names as strings then you don't have to deal with Avro, and they work really nicely. Uh, if you want to use them in a type safe manner, like the, the, the one I'm showing, it's not the best thing, but there are no good alternative. There's protobuf and uh, Swift, but there are no parquet to protobuf. Or maybe there's Swift compatibility layer, but not protobuf. So you have to kind of you know, experiment yourself so the, the ideal uh, solution, in my opinion, is uh, something like Spark SQL or Data Frame API. Of course, it's not, it's not type safe, but it's more, more agile. And also, the execution planner will be able to do some type checking before you know, actually perform the query. So, yeah. uh, you were saying that uh, like when you take the um, Parquet filters or whatever like that, you get them into the abstract syntax tree and you match them with pattern matching and stuff like that. Yeah. Have you looked at using quasi-quoting for that? Or uh, that yes. So there are two steps. Uh, go back a little bit. That's exactly what I'm doing. Mm. Actually, let's look at the code. <coughs> Apply to predicate, which is the macro, uh, macro implementation, and you can see a lot of pattern matching, like case apply of something, and extract the list of arguments, things like that. So the first step is of of course to understand the abstract syntax tree and extract you know names of methods and and types from the tree, and the next step is to generate the code, and that's where where all these you know TQ or whatever. Any, any queue, those are quasi codes. So it's a lot easier to, to generate code with quasi codes than construct those syntax trees yourself, like apply many parentheses. It's like writing closure again, but. I, I, have not any, I, I don't have anything against closure. It's, it's a pretty nice language, but in this case, you probably don't want to do that. Oh, I forgot to mention there are uh, there are a few like even nicer use cases for macro, and a lot of people are trying that. I'm actually playing around with it, and hopefully we'll have something to show. Like a lot of the SQL-like engines, you know, 
I think Slick actually does that. So if you perform SQL, of course, it returns something like a row that's untyped. You have to access fields with numbers or strings and return objects. That's kind of you know painful to use. And I think the Spark guys and also some Google people, um, BigQuery, and also some uh, Slick people on the RDBMS, they, they are working on those kind of uh, macros. So you can basically at compile time generate a return type based on your SQL query, because you already have the schema. And that's an uh, interesting use case. I think there was a talk at the BDS. Uh, I think Rob Norris, he's doing something like that. So using macro with uh, RDBMS. <coughs> 